This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon. My name is Brittany Miner. I am the coordinator for the Aging Clinical Research Consortium. Today we are going to have a presentation from Dr. Chin Yang Liu on the Internet of Medical Things, predicting clinical outcomes and digital phenotyping with wearables and machine learning. Dr. Liu is the Fulgraf Professor in the McKelvey School of Engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. His research interests include Internet of Things, real-time and embedded systems, and cyber-physical systems. Professor Liu's current work focuses on Internet of Medical Things that combines wearable devices and clinical AI for predicting clinical outcomes and digital phenotyping. Um, he is the author and co-author of over 170 research papers with over 21,000 citations and an H index of 65. Professor Liu served as editor-in-chief of ACM Transactions on Sensor Networks from 2011 to 2017, and he currently chairs the IEEE Technical Committee on Real-Time Systems. He is a fellow of IEEE. Dr. Liu, thank you for presenting today. Um, feel free to take it away. All right, uh, thanks, Brittany, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll just go ahead and get started. Uh, can you hear me well? All right, I'm yes, going to assume can you can hear me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, okay, so yes, I'll go ahead and talk about so my recent passion, right? So this is on Internet of Medical Things, and I'm going to talk about you know, why this is providing a powerful tool for clinical studies uh, involving older adults and, and outside hospitals and inside as well. Um, so I, I'm sure you're probably familiar with, you know, the internet of medical things that's happening, right? So we are, I'm talking about uh, the convergence of four pieces of technologies, right? That's all getting integrated into one right, system. Right. So we're talking about wearables uh, such as fitness, uh, fitness bands, smart watches that are becoming increasingly popular. Right. So you can continuously monitor uh, activities, heart rate, sleep. Uh, SpO2 is getting there as well. So more and more sensors right, that, that are going to be on people's wrists uh, and bodies. Um, and they are connected uh, to the Internet continuously. Right. So that allow you to do real time monitoring and uh, even intervention. And they, then there's the cloud backend, right? All these data can be fairly easily, right, uh, you know, communicated, uh, sent to the cloud and where you can do large scale, um, you know, storage and, and analysis. That means you can easily scale up uh, your study right, to larger cohorts. And then, of course, there's also this um, you know, fast growing field of machine learning and right, signal processing that you can apply. Right, to uh, a lot of these um, uh, data sets. Right? We, can, we are doing a better and better job with these modern algorithms to interpret data and predict outcomes. Right? So the often, you know, this is emerging as a very powerful tool uh, for clinical studies. And um, so, for example, if you're looking at uh, smart watches, right? so this is, um, uh, you know, this is something that not only provide all these sensors uh, that are, you know, uh, won um, uh, by the subjects, but also it has user interfaces where you can do two-way communication. That means you can actually push and receive uh, ecological momentary assessments or EMAs, right? So you can communicate with the participants as well. Uh, these are open programmable platforms, right? Be it the you know Android-based uh, ecosystem or the you know Apple Watch-based ecosystem. And others, right? You can. There's all these programming uh, interfaces where you can write apps that run that's running locally on these watches, uh, but you can also write programs that's running in the cloud and uh, receiving data uh, from the cloud services. Uh, that's the back end of these watches as well. So as I said, I'm going to uh, basically uh, uh, going to sort of pitch right IOMT. Uh, as uh, a powerful tool for clinical studies. So I'm going to uh, basically talk about three case studies, right? And uh, along the way, I'm going to explain various aspects uh, of the technology uh, that you can use. Um, so I'm going to mostly talk about uh, this uh, pilot study that we did uh, for predicting readmissions of congestive heart failure patients uh, who were recently discharged from BGH. 
so this is largely a elderly adult uh, population. I, I don't have the data with me, but I remember this is almost all older adults. Um, and uh, so uh, in this case study, I'm going to focus on two aspects. So one is uh, sort of feasibility of continuously monitor patients outside the hospital in the community with wearables. So I'm going to talk about the data yield and compliance uh, in our study. Um, then I'm going to talk about how do you sort of do machine learning right uh, for small data set, right? Uh, that's typical in uh, clinical settings, uh, uh, studies with wearables and so on. Um, then I'm going to more briefly talk about uh, our, some of our work, sort of measuring mobility, right? Such as time up and go uh, and fall detection, right? And, and, and in terms of how smart watches can help uh, in those studies. And finally, I'm going to get to the mental health aspect, right? Uh, talk a little briefly about our ongoing effort of trying to measure stress, uh, both with EMAs and also based on some machine learning models uh, with uh, based on physiological signals from the watches, right? So different uh, you know, aspects, uh, types of studies that we're doing and different underlying techniques involved. All right, I, I, of course, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions along the way. Um, I'm going to first uh, talk about the predicting readmissions. Um, so I, I guess you know, for a clinical cloud, I pro a crowd, I probably don't need to talk too much about motivation, but generally speaking, heart failure patients has a high readmission rate. Uh, there's obviously desire to do early detection of deterioration uh, among the patients after they leave the hospital. Um, and traditionally, people use LACE index, right? These are, this is a formula that's uh, largely based on inpatient data, right? Uh, you know, hospital visits and, uh, and length of stay in the hospital and so forth. Uh, the point is, once you leave the hospital, uh, there's no more monitoring um, traditionally, right? So uh, wearable devices provide a very convenient way uh, to continuously monitor the patients after they leave the hospital. So a few of us get together and say, why don't we right, try this idea? Right? So this is uh, joint work with Tom Bailey and Marion Collett uh, at the medical school. And Ding Wen is a, is a leading uh, doctoral student who did this work. And Jay, Michael, and Ben are the excellent undergrad students who built the entire sort of software infrastructure uh, for the study. So basically we have, um, three objectives in this study. One is to assess the feasibility of collecting data right, from wearable devices so continuously and over long period of time right, after patients are discharged. And second, it to explore the potential of predicting clinical deterioration among these outpatients based on the data from Fitbit, um, and then provide guidelines for future studies. So we, we focus primarily on you know, uh, assessing two challenges. Right? One is outpatient compliance, right? So basically, do people actually indeed uh, continuously wear the Fit, Fitbit band uh, for a long period of time? Do they wear it properly? Um, right? So hence that kind of serve as a clue for any future studies right, who want to use this type of uh, wearable devices for outpatient studies. A right? uh, second part is about machine learning, right? So uh, machine learning on wearable-based studies uh, and, and many other you know, traditional studies in the community, they all have similar challenges, right? You have small sample size, right? Which means you can easily overfit a model that are not actually predictive of other patients. And you have imbalanced data set. Uh, meaning, right, so the uh, clinical outcomes, be it readmissions or falls, right, are rare event, right? There are many more, right, right non-event than event, right? So that's, from a machine learning standpoint, is, some, it is a challenge that you have to address in how to do it. Um, so I get into the study, right? so this is a fairly standard, you know, uh, architecture. When you do wearable-based studies, right, we have Fitbit, Fitbit band, uh, that measure all these sensor data. Uh, then the uh, patients right, have smartphones, right? So the data go 
over the Bluetooth link and upload this data to the smartphones. Uh, and then uh, the Fitbit app right in the smartphone will just uh, send this data to the cloud. Right. And then what we did in this particular study uh, is we um, uh, we, we wrote our own databases uh, in, in the cloud as well. Uh, and then we basically, Fitbit provide this web API through which we can, we can pull all the data right out right, from, uh, out, you know, from the Fitbit cloud into our own databases. Then where we can freely do any kind of uh, analytics we want to do. There's certainly all the standard, uh, you know, privacy uh, authentication and uh, security services right along the way that uh, Fitbit support and they have to do it, uh, do the programming for, right? So it's a relatively small study. Uh, it's a uh, 25 heart failure patients. Um, uh, each of them got a Fitbit chart HR wristband. Uh, this is the one that, you know, in addition to activity and sleep, it also uh, measure heart rate. Um, and we are predicting 60, 60 day deterioration in readmission or death. Um, of the patients, um, right? Uh, uh, so we the Fitbit band measure heart rate and step count every minute, uh, and also it, it give you the sleep status, a uh, duration of the sleep, and uh, it also differentiate so the different type of sleep uh, in the so you get those kind of uh, uh, variable as well. Uh, and the the chart you can see on the bottom are the number of days different patients were uh, for, you know, wear the, the band, right? So uh, a fair number of them wear them, wear the band for a pretty long period of time, right? From, you know, 20 days to as long as um, four months. Right, so as I said, you know, we, we, are, we want to understand, um, assess, you know, how feasible it is to indeed have all these, um, you know, uh, patients Right, including in this case, uh, older adult population, right? Would they really be willing to wear this for a long period of time? Is the uh, wristband and the entire end-to-end -end data collection path reliable enough so that we would get indeed sufficient amount of data right, from these patients outside the hospital? Uh, so that's why we are looking at data yield, right? Defined as uh, the fraction of data samples successfully collected and stored in our database, right? Uh, that basically mean, right, if you are expecting heart rate data every minute, right, so you count how many minutes, right, so that patient has been wearing uh, the band, right, then you count the, how many data points you actually receive, right, so then you get the yield. Uh, so this is the overall results uh, of the 25 patients. Uh, so basically, we, we count the percentage of patients Whose data yield is above 80%. So uh, for STEP, right, so STEP is the easiest one. So actually 88% of the participants uh, give you data yield above 80%, right? So that's um, uh, pretty good. Uh, heart rate is the harder one, it's a tough one because you actually have to wear the band properly, right? Uh, because it's an optical sensor in the back of the watch of the, of the band. So, but still 60% of the participants uh, actually uh, has a data yield of 80% uh, or above, right? So that's actually uh, pretty good in my opinion. And for sleep data, right, the daily sleep data, we got 68% of the participants uh, who got data yield above 80%. And, and, and this can actually give you a uh, reflex compliance to a certain degree as well, right? For example, if you look at 60% of the patients with heart rate yield higher than 80%, uh, that basically uh, suggests about 60% of the participants actually wore the Fitbit band properly, right? So that you actually manage to get the heart rate data. Um, and the fact that you have 68% of the participants uh, with, uh, with sleep yield above 80%, uh, that basically these are the fraction of people who actually wore fit Fitbit at night, right? So that Fitbit can generate the sleep data, right? So I, I do think this is a positive result, right? In comparison to other tools, right? Based on smartphones and so on, right? So this is actually pretty high level of compliance and yield right, that suggests feasibility of long-term continuous monitoring, 
right, with wearable devices. So we looked a bit further, uh, so on the, this time on latency, right? So basically uh, from the band all the way to our own database, right? So how, how much time it would take, right? For us to get the data since it was generated. Um, overall, this is uh, the median latency at the 8.6 minutes. So that's of course uh, pretty fast. And even the, the, the 899 percentile latency, Right, if it's 22 hours, that's of course a lot longer, uh, but still means you get you know 99% of the data right, within a day. Uh, and and a, a side note is this means we did not lose data because of connectivity, right? Uh, you know, be it connectivity from the fitness band to the smartphone or from from the smartphone to the internet, uh, because Fitbit can actually locally store data for seven days. Right, since your latency is large, well below seven days, right? So you are able to get all the data into the cloud. You never lose any data in the process. Um, so that basically suggests feasibility for daily intervention. Uh, in fact, we are also limited by the fact our app, right, is outside the Fitbit native cloud, right? If if we are working with Fitbit, right, so if we can implement things within the Fitbit cloud, the latency would be uh, much smaller, in fact. All right, so that's the, the feasibility of monitoring uh, part of the study, of the analysis. So next I'm going to start talking, uh, switch gears and talk about machine learning. Right? So how do you do machine learning properly, right, uh, based on this kind of clinical data? Um, so I'm going to use one example of the machine learning uh, that we did uh, on this data. So the idea is we want to be able to um, right, uh, identify participants at high risk of deterioration using data collected from the beginning of the monitoring, right? You look at first, say, you know, 20 days of data, then you try to predict, right, in the future, right, whether this patient would uh, be readmitted admitted or die. Um, so, uh, obviously, I'm, so uh, in terms of machine learning models, these are, you know, we basically uh, it's called all these fairly standard uh, machine learning models. Because of the small data size, I'll mention that we are not doing deep learning, right? Uh, as you may have heard, uh, because deep learning only work well with sort of much, uh, you know, very large amount of data. So that wouldn't be, it would be suitable for a lot of the EHR data that we, we look at, look at uh, but not only for this kind of a wearable based studies in the community, you simply don't have enough sample size. But, for, but on the other hand, there exists right, a plethora of machine learning uh, methods that are suitable for small uh, data samples, right? So, right, such as random forest, SVM, and so forth, uh, that's listed uh, here. Right. Um, right, so then you, you first you have to do some uh, data pre-processing, right? So basically we, uh, pull data from the Fitbit APIs, and we get all these essentially time series data, right? In terms of step count and um, uh, and uh, uh, heart rate, right? These are time series data, right? As well as sleep efficiency data, right? In the uh, those are the daily data, um, and you have to do some data cleansing as typical, uh, in, uh, you know, this kind of studies. Uh, but then uh, in, in the next step in um, machine learning is you have to do so-called feature engineering, right? So basically you, you take all these time series data, right? So what kind of um, features of this data that you should use as input variables to your model, right? So, um, so what we did was um, we take statistical features um, of these time series data, right? For example, you take um, uh, first order statistics such as mean, max, you know, uh, you know over uh, a time window, right? Uh, or you can do second order, uh, you know, features, right? Such as energy, entropy, right, correlation, right? Of these time series data. Or you can do uh, this something called detrenched fluctuation analysis, which turns out to be quite useful. This is essentially measure um, the degree of self-similarity uh, in, in time series data, uh, a particular statistical feature. But then we all also look at sort of semantic features that are probably more uh, meaningful to a clinician, 
right, such as the sedentary behavior, right? So basically something called sedentary bout, right? For basically for the period of time, uh, time segments when this person did not move at all, right? With no step count, right? Uh, that, that kind of um, uh, semantic features, right? All these become potential input variables, right? Into the machine learning model, uh, where then you use this construct the model to predict whether a patient will be. Right. So uh, you have to be really careful when you don't have a ton of data, right? So basically, um, uh, because first person want to establish some uh, feasibility uh, to actually use these potential features uh, to predict the outcome, uh, because you don't want to force it, uh, because then you end up coming up with a model that might be overfitting for this small data set, but end up not being predictive in a more general population. So how do you assess uh, feasibility, right, is what you do. The first thing you do is to uh, do some sort of statistical analysis uh, on, uh, right, uh, on these data set, right? So for example, a fairly commonly used uh, approach is called the ANOVA test, right? So that's the analysis of variance, right? Essentially it answers, are there statistically significant differences between patients with different outcomes, right? So if you look at all these, features or input variables, you know, are there any sort of really significant differences between the patients who were readmitted or the patients who were not, right? So essentially that's what we are looking at. So basically you end up with, you know, these statistical uh, outputs such as F statistics you know, and P values that indicate whether the differences are indeed statistically significant, right? So this is important, right? Because essentially inherently you are saying there got to be some differences, right? In the input variables of these uh, different patients with different outcomes, right? To have any hope, right? Of thinking these features would be predictive, right? Of the actual outcome, right? So, so it's advisable to uh, first do this kind of a statistical analysis to establish feasibility. Uh, and on our data set, uh, so we are looking at, of course, the groups, right? Uh, deteriorated group patients versus the non-deteriorated patients. And uh, the ANOVA test indeed, right, uh, reveals significant differences in some of the features uh, that we derive from the data, right? For example, these F values, right, it, it should be large and P values should be small uh, in this table that would suggest uh, the significant differences, right? Indeed, as you can see here, right? Different features, several features. These are the top five features that I have the most you know, apparent differences, right? HR features, right? Uh, restless and, and time in bed, right? So indeed, right? This give you a fairly strong hint that these variables do matter, right? Uh, do, do make a difference uh, in the outcome. So then the next step you do is you, uh, in machine learning, there's a, a standard methodology to do feature selection automatically. So, so we do not look at, you know, these tens of features, sometimes hundreds of features and do a manual selection, but rather they're standard procedures where you can use to uh, automatically reduce the number of features and keep the features that are most predictive of the, of the outcome. This is important because you only have 25 patients, right? So you don't want to, um, you know, have a model with 200 features, right? Then that would be a, a, a easy recipe for overfitting, right? So, um, so basically, end up indeed. These are the some of the features that were selected uh, by the machine learning models, right? Using the feature selection procedure. Uh, and you know, to give us further evidence, if, if, if we apply the ANOVA test, uh, indeed the features selected indeed show statistically significant differences right, between the deteriorated patients and the non-deteriorated patients. Okay, so uh, and another point you have to be careful is how do you evaluate with small data set? Uh, so, um, so, so generally, you know, uh, the, the, if you have a data set, right, the general procedure is you divide the data set between the training set and the testing set, right? Then, then you train your machine learning model with the training set, 
then you evaluate it with a separate subset of the data, the test set, to evaluate it, right? Uh, a challenge with a small data set, of course, you know, you don't have much data to divide, right? Uh, but you still want to have, you know, enough confidence that your machine learning model is indeed predictive in general. Um, so that's why, you know, this is the example where um, you could, uh, how do you do, you know, evaluation using a very small data set? This is the one called leave one out cross validation, right? The idea is very simple, right? You, you leave one sample, right, uh, out for testing. That means one patient. Uh, and then train the model with the other samples, right? So that would be the 24 patients. Um, and then you keep redoing it with different patients, right? Uh, uh, kept as testing, uh, for testing and the, the other patients uh, used for training. So, so you basically, you, you try this over and over again uh, with different patients for testing. So that's a pretty standard cross-validation approach when you don't have a whole lot of data. All right. So then, as I said, you really need to be careful about overfitting. So, uh, so that's why, uh, so this is one technique you can use to sort of assess if overfitting is actually happening with your model. The idea is once you have a model, there's a trend, then you compare the prediction error of the, of the model on the training data set versus the error on the uh, testing uh, data set. Right. So the idea is, uh, you know, if you are do the model is much more accurate with the training data set, but much less accurate on the testing data set, that, that's a suggestion that, you know, indication that you are overfitting the model. The model really just work well for the training data. It's not generally predictive of data that is not trendless. Right. So that's not not what you want to see. Right. So what you do is you uh, compare the accuracy uh, between the training data set and the testing data set, right? Um, uh, and you want to pick a setting where a, a model where the two are fairly close, right? So this is the example where uh, we are tuning a parameter of one of the machine learning models called the K nearest neighbors. Uh, we're trying to select the right K, right? Uh, so here, basically, naturally, we pick the K where there's the smallest differences, right, uh, in terms of uh, the error of the testing data set versus the training data set. Again, there's one more technique to safeguard against overfitting on small data set. Right, so another thing that you have to be careful when you deal with small data set, especially an imbalanced one, uh, is uh, how do you actually evaluate? What metrics do you use to evaluate the machine learning models? Um, the right, imbalance, as I said before, is basically the two group of patients, right? In our case, the patients uh, who were readmitted versus the patients who were not. They are, you're, you're, all, you're only imbalanced, right? So there's many fewer patients who were readmitted than the patients who were not, right? So the same thing is true for most clinical problems that we have encountered so far, uh, be it fall studies, be it, you know, hypothemia, you know, all these different conditions, they, they all tend to be reasonably rare event, right? So in this case, it's certainly ins insufficient to just look at accuracy of prediction, right? For example, if you have a one to nine positive to negative ratio, right? Positive meaning you have a clinical outcome that's, that's bad, right? Negative being relatively healthy, right? So the predictor, the model can easily achieve 0 0.9 accuracy, I'm correct, 90% of the time, if I just simply predict everything as negative, right? Because it's the, the, the data set is dominated by the negative samples. But that's not okay, right? <laughs> because that's defeat the purpose of predicting the positive clinical outcomes, right? Uh, so that's why you basically have to look at uh, this um, you know, whole set of statistical uh, metrics, such as sensitivity, specificity, and precision, right, in order to uh, have an overall, you know, assessment, right, uh, of the uh, of the effectiveness of your predictive model, right? Sensitivity is defined, for example, by two positive divided by two positive plus plus negative, uh, and specificity is defined by two negative, right, divided by two negative plus plus positive, and so forth, right? Um, I will not go into the details of the metrics, but this is fairly uh, standard set of metrics, right, in statistics and machine learning. Right. 
So just to give you a sense of the, the result that we got right from these machine learning models. Um, so right, so basically, um, if uh, for you said we are using first 20 days of data as input, right, to predict the eventual readmission or death of the patients. Uh, the specificity is fixed at 0 0.95. Uh, so uh, the, the, the quick thing is through this evaluation, it shows the KNN model uh, was the most accurate and effective uh, on this data set, right? So uh, as shown in this right, uh, cohort of metrics that we're using uh, to assess the effectiveness of the model, uh, notably, right, we have much higher specificity, precision, and accuracy than the lace index that, that's used in clinical practice. Okay, so just to summarize the machine learning part, right? So just a few uh, sort of uh, advice in terms of how do you do machine learning with small data? I guess the first message is you can do machine learning with small data. Uh, so there, you know, uh, there's some uh, concern that you know, some assumption that you have to have a massive amount of data to do machine learning, uh, that is not true. Uh, so in, in fact, even with a moderate amount of data, uh, there, there are useful machine learning te techniques that you can use to construct uh, you know, useful models, predictive models. Uh, but certainly more data is always helpful, right? Um, so basically a few advice, right? You want to, number one, you want to apply statistical analysis first to assess feasibility of prediction. Right, so uh, looking at the features to see if there, there is a difference, right, between their values between right different uh, patients with different outcomes. Um, but you certainly, when you have a small data set, you have to be extra careful uh, with your methodology in training the model and evaluating the model. Right, don't just look at accuracy. You have to look at uh, right the, uh, the the multitude of metrics uh, in a balanced way. Uh, when your data set is imbalanced <laughs> and uh, you want to assess overfitting right avoid overfitting by checking the differences in the uh, accuracy between training set and testing set uh, there also exist techniques to mitigate overfitting as well that i'm not getting into and generally you have to do a lot of data cleansing with the data uh, you know, before you actually plug them into all these machine learning procedures right um, all right, so, th so that's the readmission study that I have so far. Um, does anyone have questions? I want, want me to stop a bit, or should I just move on? Okay, all right. So, um, so I'll go ahead and, and, and talk about some um, uh, more recent work uh, that, uh, to measure mobility. All right, so this is um, uh, ongoing work. So, uh, so this so this region, my doctoral student already developed this system. Right, so that's basically uh, you can conduct a, a timed up and go test uh, at home. Right, so so that you know instead of you have to wait for the uh, patients uh, that you want to measure mobility uh, for uh, to come to your clinic to do the timed up and go, you can actually have them to do it you know, every day uh, or multiple times a day if you can get them to do it. But the idea is to have this watch, uh, a smartwatch app that does all the signal processing and uh, analytics to measure the uh, timed up and go results and also sort of administer the whole process of doing it, right? So the watch would pop up and remind participants to take assessments, right? As the screenshot of the watch uh, shows, right? Then then it's going to you know uh, have the participant do the timed up and go exercise uh, and then it's going to automatically upload the data to the cloud for analysis then right it has we have the algorithm to actually analyze gait and motion features in addition to the total duration of the timed up and go process uh, and and you know, we can do real-time feedbacks, right, to physicians and participants, right, of the results uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to actually play this video um, uh, that Rishin did last night, <laughs> just to give you a sense of how this works uh, in reality. How does it work? Yeah. Okay, so this is Rishin. <laughs> um, 
right? So basically, it's the uh, and on the upper right corner, you'll see the synchronized uh, screenshot of the watch, right? So basically, we are doing it, it's assessing it. Then you stop it, right? Then it's going to upload the data automatically to the cloud, right? Over Wi Fi in this case. Uh, so this is something that you can uh, patients can do at home. Okay, all right. So and then this just actually reminded me. I told Susie recently um, that yeah, so that we can do a fall study a lot better <laughs> with a smartwatch. Uh, so this is a joint. This was a past fall study uh, that uh, Susie and I did. Uh, uh, you know, using sort of old fashioned hardware, right? So this is a, a device called a shimmer, right? It basically has a, a plethora of uh, motion sensors, uh, but it's very sort of old fashioned, right? This was about five years ago, right? So it has no screen, uh, it has all kinds of um, uh, limitations, right? So then, so, so we, of course we got some interesting, you know, hints, right? From that study, we published a paper about it. Uh, but in retrospect, right, we we have a number of really sort of hard lessons that we learned right from that study, right? Uh, and then we came up with some wish list, right? So you know, if we do this again, uh, we should really be able to do the following thing, right? The first is right this whole thing about uh, ground truth or false, right? So uh, as you know, probably that traditionally it's just relies on fall journals, right? Uh, they uh, older adult, write down, you know, what time uh, he or she fell, right, uh, in, in a paper journal, right, so that's sort of the gold standard today. Um, the problem is really ill-suited for developing a fault detection algorithm and evaluating the algorithms, because usually, first of all, right, they, they don't necessarily record all the faults. Secondly, the time stamp of the faults are, you know, generally quite approximate. Right, so that makes actually a huge difference in, if you want to actually evaluate your fault detection algorithm. Right, if you are, you know, a minute apart, right, for the data traces that we're looking at, that make a, that's very very far apart from you know uh, what the model needs to look at. Right, um, so basically, we, so we concluded, you know, fault data really need to be recorded and annotated in real time, right, instead of having. Uh, the participant write them down later, right? The next morning or something, right? Um, the second, we really need continuous connectivity with the devices, right? Uh, so so that we could do remote communication with the sensors. Uh, in fact, with the participants as well, so we can inspect that everything is going well. And certainly, they generally hardware make a big difference, right? You want to have accurate clock, right? Basic things. Uh, you want to have you know, user interfaces, right? And it should be comfort to wear, right? And it should be suitable to do a larger studies, right? A few days ago, I was teaching uh, my IoT class uh, and I was giving a lecture on this paper that I realized, huh, if, you, if we do this again, we can easily overcome the challenges that we're talking about uh, using a smartwatch, right? We can certainly develop an easy sort of EMA or, 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 uh, or app that pop up right uh, EMAs to, to let the user uh, you know record and annotate uh, in real time on the watch right a fall that just happened right that and then the uh, the watch would be able to automatically timestamp it um, we can, we certainly would have continuous connectivity with devices and with the participants as well. Um, it's also a nice user interface. It's comfort to wear, at least, a lot, at least based on the Fitbit study, a lot of people are willing to wear it for a long period of time that in turn allow you to plan larger studies as well, right? So, uh, so this seems to have a lot of potential. It would be really interesting to revisit it. Okay. So now I'm going to get to the final segment uh, of, of this talk, right, about measuring stress. So we're getting to the mental health aspect. Um, so this is joint work with Thomas uh, and Rishi Yang again did uh, the system development and you know a, a clinical uh, study is underway uh, to start with healthy patients, uh, healthy participants at this point. So, but this is uh, we are actually using a smartwatch uh, in this particular case. It's a fossil watch uh, that runs Google's software called the Wear OS. 
so the idea idea is first of all we want to do EMA, right? So um, so this is this a screenshot of the watch, right? So basically uh, EMA asking people, uh, you know, how do you feel in the last hour, uh, stress level, happy level. Uh, watch surface is of course is watch face is not very large, but on the other hand, if you look at these screenshots, right? These are you can actually fit some meaningful EMAs right in this fairly uh, relatively small screen size, nevertheless. Uh, and then we are using the same smartwatch app to administer the whole sort of stress uh, study as well. Remember, we're measuring stress in two ways: EMA as well as based on sort of the PPG sensors. That's a light sensor in the back of the uh, of the watch, where you can use to measure heart rate variability and respiratory rate. And in turn, you can construct uh, machine learning models to estimate stress. Um, so basically, this is a you know uh, actually the bottom middle one is a screenshot. It's in GIF, so it's animation. It actually shows you know how you can use the watch. This. So just some early results. This is still ongoing. This is all quite preliminary. Uh, but basically, we have healthy uh, volunteers in the medical school to participate in lab tests where they first do the stressors. Uh, those of you who have done mental health probably know stressors are speech, you know, solving math problems, and put your hand on something really cold. Uh, so these are sort of uh, traditional gold standard for generating stress uh, uh, in participants. So we, we, the interesting thing that we found with EMAs uh, is it turns out at least for that particular you know group of participants we have at the medical school, um, only math was effective right to generate stress right like a speech and code uh, no problem at all. In fact, they generated no instance of stress <laughs> according to EMA right. So this shows that EMA is useful, uh, but it also shows uh, it's important right to use EMA to validate uh, uh, stresses. So that, that's what we thought is, we were not expecting this. That's, that's, that's kind of an interesting lesson to be learned. Um, then we also did the stress based on PPG sensor. So this is where I would caution, uh, this is quite preliminary at this point, uh, but what, uh, because the small data size at this point. But interestingly, we already found that the machine learning models would actually achieve much higher level of accuracy on the math uh, based stressor. Uh, which is actually, you know, give us uh, some confidence because math, remember, is the only stressor that actually generates stress uh, using the, according to the EMA. So this is actually consistency, right, between what the EMA is telling us uh, versus what the machine learning model based on sensor data is telling us. Okay, all right. So I, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. So I mean, uh, just to recall that we have gone over but three different user use cases right, of using smartwatches and uh, and machine learning or, or, or IOMT to do clinical studies, right? Predicting clinical deterioration among outpatients, right? Measuring mobility right, of outpatients, and measuring stress, right? So this shows the uh, you know uh, some some samples in the space uh, where you know uh, IOMT can be sort of useful, and we have sort of a, a number of other studies that's going on right now. Uh, so these are you know samples in that in the different possibilities right um again i'll just wrap up by saying so this is really a very powerful tool right to use wearables in combination with machine learning and connectivity uh, for clinical studies and both inside and outside hospitals and um, certainly i'd be happy to to discuss like collaboration opportunities and uh, try to get these uh, to to more and more clinical studies to release this power, basically. Um, so th that's my talk, and uh, welcome any questions. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Liu. Um, I had a, a question. Um, do you find that you have to do a lot of education for participants who are, um, for participants on the technology uh, to get them to be willing to use it? <laughs> um, th that's interesting. So um, actually it was a, the heart failure patient study was a little more challenging because it's older adults, right? So, uh, and uh, 
I, I do recall it took a while to get enough recruitment. Um, uh, but but then, as our data show, in terms of compliance and data yield, they seem to be uh, pretty good. Um, in fact, we are doing an ongoing study with um, uh, Chet's team at the uh, cancer center, uh, where we are working at pancreas cancer patients uh, with Fitbit again. And it seems to be the recruitment seems easier. And um, uh, it's, I guess it's a younger population. I think it depends, but certainly our data shows it's promising that people can do this. Great. Um, and then I was just asking, had a question about the tug so um, that mm -hmm. you're using for the with the smartwatch. So do people have to select to upload it or does it just upload on its own once it's done? It, it's upload on its own. I okay. think, the, as you can see from the screenshot, uh, uh, the participant would have to push a stop button. Then uh -huh. once, once the stop button is pushed, it automatically uploads the data uh, over okay. Wi-Fi. Okay, okay. Um, so is one of the um, requirements that people must have Wi-Fi then, or? Um, there are different ways. It all, none is perfect, right? The other <laughs> way is to use uh, cell phones. Right, so basically, you can I can upload the data over Bluetooth uh, to mm -hmm. this person's smartphone, uh, and then smartphone can upload it. That's kind of what we did with the Fitbit study. Okay. And uh, it, then you can also do right. There exist um, cellular-based smartwatches, right? That does right. not require a smartphone. That's probably the most expensive, but also yeah. uh, the most reliable way, right? right. So if you do an Apple Watch, if you do the you know Samsung Watch. Uh, they all do the cellular services. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But okay. All right. Well, um, I thought that was a, a wonderful talk. Um, thank you so much for presenting. Did anyone else have any questions? Okay. Well, um, thank you again. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sounds good. Well, you're welcome to send me email if you have more questions. Okay, sounds great.